Welcome back to Downton Kitchen, a show where we bring some of the most notable dishes from Downton Abbey right into your home. I'm Chef Nini Nguyen, and in today's episode, we're making a British tea time staple, scones. That's so delicious. This is perfection. So let's get started. Would this be a Downton-inspired cooking show without scones? Well, I doubt it. As long as they've been a mainstay at tea time, they've also been the topic of a couple of big debates. Oh, here we go. The pronunciation from scone to scone and how they're served. Luckily, today we have an expert on this subject. Please welcome the author of the official Downton Abbey cookbook, Annie Gray. Hi. Hi, welcome to Downton Kitchen. Thank you very much for having me. I am so excited to have you show me the ropes on how to make a proper scone. It's a good choice of recipe. It's one of the classics of Downton Abbey, and I think probably still a recipe that most Brits today would say they really love. So here I have my flour, my sugar, and my baking powder. Mm -hmm. And you can correct me anytime <laughs> I'm doing something wrong. Um, but to this, I'm going to add some lard and butter. Yeah. Now. Can we substitute it with shortening if we want it to be vegetarian? Um, yes, so you could use all butter. You can use margarine, although to be honest, that's a bit late 20th century. That's a bit We don't want to be We don't want to go 1960s here. on it, do we? Um, and it's quite important for them to be reasonably well chilled. But so I like to use lard and butter as a mixture because the lard softens the crumb quite a lot. Uh, if you add uh, lard into a, a loaf of bread, for example, you'll get a really nice soft crumb. So I quite like that mixture. Would you like me to crack some eggs into this milk? Yes. So I'm working the butter and the lard into the flour, and we want it to kind of have a consistency of breadcrumbs, right? Yeah. Um, you, you sort of, it's a lot like making pastry. The early scones didn't have any raising agent in, so the baking powder is what makes them a kind of modern scone. Uh, baking powder was only really invented in the 1850s. So before that, there were scones, but they were more like a, a griddle bread, a kind of, I suppose, a, an unleavened bread that was often done on a flat baking stone. Oh. So these are really Edwardian in their feel, so that's exactly when the series opens. I heard you say scone. So it's S-K-O-N, not scone. Well, a lot of people do say scones. It's kind of a, a, a north-south divide in Britain. So scones have a really strong association with Scotland, and the Scottish pronunciation of scone is scone. But they became very popular off the back of the tourist trade in the 1920s and 30s in Devon and Cornwall. And there, a lot of the time, people say scone. So still today, lots of people say scone, but more and more people say scone. Yeah. I always always say scone. <laughs> in America, we say scone. Say it again. Talk in that voice. <laughs> Couldn't you just learn the accent a bit better and do it again? Whenever I'm working butter or lard into flour, I kind of shift it in between my hands making sure the butter is cold and breaking apart so that there's just little flecks of butter and lard in each and every scone. Yeah, that's what you want. You kind of want them in the oven to then melt and explode and just force all those layers apart so it tastes really good. And you can vary, of course, the amount of sugar you put in these. You could add a bit of spice if you wanted to be a bit outre and modern, but yeah. we're going pure downtown, so ours are quite nice and plain because the plainer the better for afternoon tea. My hands are a little tied. Would you help me? Yeah. Ready? Awesome, yes. So are you more by feel? Because I see you're not pouring it all in. Do you add as you go for the texture of the dough? Yeah, versus... well, as you will know, flowers differ and the temperature of the room differs and sometimes your flour is a bit moist. And certainly in the past, if you were actually at Downton Abbey, you would often keep your flour in a dry store or even above a fireplace to make sure it was very dry. Uh, even today, I find that flowers do differ and especially British flowers versus American flowers, mm -hmm. cake flour versus uh, normal flour. You know, so I always would say just add most of it and then add the rest of it. Add if you need. Yeah. So how am I doing so far? You want you to look, grade it, me? It looks like it's doing all right. Yeah, so I don't think we will need much more milk, yeah. will we? So I'm just going to knead this and make it into one nice 
dough, but it should be a little crumbly. Certainly a bit crumbly. Dry spots? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. You don't want it to be too sticky, so when you do roll it out, you'll need flour to roll it out, but you don't want it to be sort of horrible and sticking to your surface. And yeah. To, it's nothing worse than a sticky scone. This is a no sticky scone zone. <laughs> uh, I'm just now very needy. I need you to help me put the currants in. That's fine. Let's have a feel. <laughs> Will you um, just prop that little cup? for that. Uh -huh. And then I'll let you get your hands dirty. Yeah, I'll do the heavy lifting. You sit back. <laughs> Where did you get this recipe from? So every recipe in the book is drawn from a historic source, a, a book published between 1875 and 1930, so really very closely fitting Downton Abbey in the period in which it's set. I drew this from a book by George Cox, which was published in 1983 called The Art of Confectionery, and it's a trade manual. So the original recipe was for vast quantities of scones. Scones are one of those things which were really easy to make and very economical and very popular and keep reasonably well as well. So one of the reasons they became very popular was because they were kind of really ideal for cafes and tea rooms to make and then sell to consumers at relatively inflated prices. And you can, of course, change them really easily by adding currants or adding spice or mm -hmm. serving them with different jams, that kind of thing. So trade manuals are a really good source for recipes like this. And a lot of the time, the original scones would have been made quite large and then you'd have cut them almost all the way through so that when you served them, they would end up being triangular. And of course, today we make much, much smaller round scones, which is, uh, I think, what we're going to do today and they're much more suitable for a kind of piling up on a, on a cake stand like that. Yes. But um, it's a really nice book, but it is quite scary, the amount sometimes that you turn out with that book. All right, so now we're going to roll this out. So do you usually like to use a rolling pin or do you like to kind of flatten it out with your hands? I do love a rolling pin, but I'm quite finickety about rolling pins. I've got a Victorian one, which is absolutely beautiful to use because there's kind of decades and decades of grease have gone into this thing. So it's smooth and it's really tactile and you kind of realize that sometimes objects, especially in kitchens, they're really kind of form and function follow and it's very beautiful. But modern rolling pins. <laughs> well, one day maybe I'll inherit a old Victorian <laughs> rolling pin. If not, there's always the internet. So I'm going to dust a nice heavy dusting of flour on my work surface because we don't want sticky scones. No. <laughs> and I'm just going to invert my dough right out. And it's okay if there's some dry spots because that's ideally that's what you want. So we want to basically press this. About how thick do you think we should have it? I would normally go about that thick. So what's that? Sort of an inch yeah. in American numbers? Yeah. That's what I would call two and a half centimeters. Okay. So you could, if you don't have a rolling pin, just pat it out with your hands. Just be very gentle. You don't want to overwork the dough. And, or you can use a nice dusted rolling pin. And you just gently roll it. And this is going to be nice because it makes it a little bit more even. And now to flute or not to flute? Well, I'm not that keen on fluting. What a colourful life you lead. I just like, I think afternoon tea, it needs to be plain, it needs to be delicate, it needs to be, there's no fuss, no frou-frou. But I do understand that lots of people like a bit of fluting, so um, by all means flute. <laughs> we'll, we'll compromise. <laughs> I'll do half and half. I mean, I really like flute. Like, look at my shirt. My shirt's That's true. Flute. I mean, you really do have to flute at that point, don't you? <laughs> so, Whenever cutting any kind of dough like this, you want to make sure you dust your cutter with some flour so that it doesn't stick. Because again, no sticky scones. And we're gonna pop that out. And they're so cute. They're so cute when they first start. And now we're going to put this on the tray. So I'll continue to cut and then you want you're brushing it with some Yeah, just milk. a little bit of milk. You can use an egg wash instead, but it's just to make it have a really lovely sheen on top because if these are going to be served at your country house style party, what you want is for them to sort of shine and look really appetizing. I mean, we eat yeah. with our eyes, don't we? Yes. So really, you need these to look as if Lady Mary herself would be proud. I think I'm going to cry. Do you think Mrs. Patmore would approve of my scone making today? Oh, I think so. We'll see about that. She could do with some more help in the kitchen. It's been, yeah. what, 
like a decade and a half I with know. just poor Daisy. Less philosophy, more elbow grease. I think my I think my scones might be a little fat. Well, if they're not that ladylike, they can always go down for the housekeeper's tea. <laughs> Uh, the thing about country houses like Downton Abbey in reality was that there's an awful lot of food being consumed by a lot of different groups. So you'd have something that was small and delicate and took a lot of time and was quite expensive for the family. But of course the servants also had to eat and we see that a lot in the series. We see the, the Downton Abbey servants eating. So if these don't look quite good enough to go up to Lord and Lady Grantham and their family, they could always go off for wow. Mr. Carson. They won't mind, not this once. What was the hardest recipe to develop when making this book? Probably the orange cake. Uh, it was one of those things where I thought, oh, this sounds absolutely delicious. I love citrus flavors. Uh, and the idea of a layered orange cake with a uh, candied orange peel on top, to me, just sounded like something that really needed to be in there. Are oranges prevalent here and, and at that time? Um, no, they would have been imported. Although a country house like Downton Abbey, certainly when Downton opened in 1912, would have had an incredible uh, kitchen garden. And kitchen gardens at country houses were heated with coal stoves, so you would have heated walls, heated greenhouses. Uh, you could produce almost anything you wanted to. Lots of people now talk about how everything was seasonal in the past and how it was some sort of lovely era where we only ate whatever was in season, but in practice that meant we would have eaten brassicas, like nothing but cabbage for four months. Nobody wants to do that. So uh, kitchen gardens like the one which would have been at the real Downton Abbey, really, really important. And they would have been growing citrus fruits. So oranges, lemons, citrons, um, you know, all sorts of different things. So it was always a mark of wealth to be able to grow something out of season. It's mm -hmm. the same with pineapples. Yeah. If you had a pineapple that you'd produced in your own garden, I mean, you know, this is saying, I am so rich. <laughs> we don't need to talk about money. Here's the last one. Now, these scones are gonna go into a hot oven for about 10 minutes and you want the high heat so that it rises, correct? Yeah, again, a lot like pastry. You'd always put it in a hot oven, instant rise, get it done, get them out, and then try to resist eating them until they're cool enough that you won't burn your mouth. So how did they make ovens back then? Well, the ones at Downton, quite modern when you see them. They are coal-fired, which would have been accurate for 1912 and certainly well into the 1920s and 30s as well. But they're those big iron ranges that you see, and, and that's absolutely classic of a lot of country houses. You could walk into a country house kitchen, even in the 1950s, and still see coal-fired ranges being used, although a lot of them had then sort of put in a supplementary kitchen with either a gas range or still a solid fuel range, but much smaller. So we look at that technology and we think, my goodness me, it's so old fashioned. But here in Britain, a lot of people were using that well into the 1950s and 60s. So, um, you know, even our own grandparents almost certainly would have known how to work a range like that. Well, I do not. So I'm really <laughs> happy that we have modern technology and we have an oven. So I'm gonna grab the door. This is nice, having a second set of hands. Perfect. Quickly close it, because we don't want any of that heat to get out. And now we wait. <sighs> I know. We should probably make some tea or something. I, I think that I can make that happen. I think always, tea is, tea is the solution. That sounds good to me. I think I'll have another cup. Here we have our scones. They've been cooling off, and now we can finish our wonderful spread. Will you pour some tea? Absolutely. I'm always willing to play mother. Oh, it's quite hot. These are so nice and light and fluffy. I love how they're cracked in the middle. They smell absolutely lovely. Milk? No milk. What? Is that, is that blasphemy? Please. We got through the war. We can get through this. So maybe I should, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna be adventurous today. <laughs> Give me a nice splash. I, I want it proper. I want it however you want it. Cause I'm just gonna copy you. That was a good decision. Perfect, well, thank you. Clearly I should be a butler or a housemaid, but I'm not, so there you go. So here we have a couple of delicious, beautiful treats. Yeah, we've got quite a selection there. You've got lemon posset, uh, which is a sort of 
it, it's a modern twist on a historic classic, really, especially the way it's been presented. But you often would have had things like custard served in glasses, often as part of your dinner. Uh, so that's a kind of lemony custard, if you like. Battenberg cake, which started life as domino cake. Uh, and had many more squares, and that's flavoured easily with rose water, apricot jam in the middle. It's kind of one of those classic cakes that today has been quite devalued. It's often quite a commercial cake, but was very popular in the past. And then we've got our gorgeous scones, which is far more where we want to be because they're plain, they're lovely, they puffed up really, really nicely. There's a sort of lusciousness about them, which I think is absolutely where we want to be. So I want to watch you eat a scone because I want to eat it the proper way. And I know that there's a lot of tension on whether you put cream or jam first. I have something in my brain and I'll tell you after I see you do it. From a practical standpoint, I tend to go cream first, then jam. Um, That's but to be honest, it doesn't matter as long as you've got a lot of both. What's lovely about these as well is the size of them. If you go out for afternoon tea today, you'll often get very large scones because afternoon teas become an occasion where you go out and you go out with all your friends and you have this huge meal and then you can't eat dinner. But when it was first introduced, which was really the late 18th century as a kind of snack in between what had just been introduced, which was lunch and then dinner, the idea was it just was a kind of tidying you over meal. So that idea that it should be a meal in and of itself and then you don't have lunch and you don't have dinner, it's kind of, it's a bit much to be honest. The idea is just that we have something light, something lovely, something small. I think it's an excellent idea. So clotted cream, let's talk about it. How do you make it and why is this one different from the one I get in America? Um, it started life as clouted cream, or sometimes clotted cream, and you make it by sort of boiling it really, really slowly so it starts to coagulate and, and gets a lot of very sour notes. And it is, I mean, it's very different to straight cream. It has mm -hmm. got, or should have, a lot more flavour and be a lot more scabby, as you can see there. I um, love it. And it used to be something that you made really across the whole of Britain, if not the whole of Europe. But slowly as the train system increased, as regionality increased, as, as foods became more homogenous, what happened was some foods became associated with certain regions more than others. Mm -hmm. And clotted cream ended up being very much associated with Devon and Cornwall. In the same way that a pasty is now a Cornish pasty, but it used to be something that you'd eat right across Europe and wasn't at all Cornish. So a lot of regional foods once weren't and now are. But the main thing is it needs to be really, really sour and really gorgeous and really just, you know, nothing moves. It's almost like a cheese, yeah. like the texture. Was it to help like preserve Yes. The cream? Exactly that. It does keep much longer and people really got a taste for it and it became kind of a really popular product very, very early on actually. So sort of ended, well, very early on, end of the 19th century as tourism starts did again, you started to get a lot more people talking about cream. And one of the things about meals like this was the 1920s and 30s, so the period that Downton is set in at the moment and the period uh -huh. that the film will be set in, at that point, cars were starting to become more popular, so people were travelling a lot more, and they were having meals like this and suddenly going, my goodness me, this is the heritage of Britain, we've forgotten all about this. And there was this almost this craze for rediscovering lost things and for eating regionally. And everyone forgot that 200 years ago we'd have been eating this, well, not with raising agents, but we'd have been eating breads with jam and cream right across Britain. But you could, if you wanted to, Go for the real Devonshire twist and have um, treacle with your cream. Really? Mm, thunder and lightning, it's called. Oh. Some do it with golden syrup, but that's kind of a very late 19th century invention. Uh, and some do it with this stuff, which is a really, really good baking ingredient. We call it black treacle here, but it's basically molasses, blackstrap molasses. Well, cheers. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Pinkies out. Mmm. I'm a pig. This is so good. I'm I just very much one a moment with below this. Below stairs. <laughs> hmm? I'm very much below stairs. Oh no, I'm I'm just trying to be <laughs> dainty. There's a reason I wrote the book. I'm solidly mm. in the cook's room and very much not in the drawing room. That's so delicious. I love clotted cream. I didn't grow up eating dairy. And I just remember the first time having clotted cream, I'm like, I was mad. I was like, why didn't I have this earlier in my life? Why did my family deprive me of this? But the balance between the creaminess from the clotted cream and the jam on top of the scone is just so good. It's like, 
I love creamy things and tart things together, and it's just the perfect marriage. It's why I think you need to make sure that your afternoon tea things are plain. And I love proofing up a scone. I think that throwing loads of things in it, it's a wonderful idea. But at that point, you don't need anything on it. Mm. Whereas if you're having tea like this, you're totally right. You want a plain scone, the sort of sour notes and creamy notes of that cream, and then the kind of zing from the jam. And it's, you don't need much else. Sometimes the plainest things in life are the most beautiful. I think so. This is perfection. Thank you so much, Annie, for showing me the ropes on a proper tea time. <laughs> I had so much fun. I'm glad. I mean, I'm hoping that you'll do this loads and loads more times now, and everybody in America will be going, English afternoon tea. I'm pretty much ready to have my own tea party. They better be warned. The British are coming. Well, we have way more downs and dishes coming your way. So join us next time as we come together over our next delicious Downton-inspired recipe.